This inspired Insider.com interviews with Joy, who's the founder of Postcard Mania. She's turned it into over a $40 million a year business. Listen to the hustle Joy has when she goes to collect money from a financial advisor that owed her. Also, she talks about their no-fail hiring system and why the staff has been there for so long. You'll never guess what's a fireable offense at their company. Also, what professions are most likely to respond to direct mail and what did she do that doubled their revenue? That and much more coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Joy Genduza, and she's the founder and CEO of Postcard Mania. Now in 1998, it was just Joy with a phone and a computer. Today, she has more than 200 employees and brings in more than $40 million in revenue annually. That's unbelievable, Joy. And the company has more than 57,000, I checked the website today, 57,103 customers. Thanks for, thanks for being here, Joy. My pleasure. It's funny that you checked the website today because I didn't know we broke 57,000 until you mentioned it. <laughs> it is, and it's probably more as of that we're talking right now. Um, so we get a lot of comments from people who have tons of ideas, they don't know where to start, they have a or they have a current product and service and they're trying to get you know traction with their sales, they're not growing as fast as they want, or sometimes they just have the fear of failure and embarrassment with starting something. And you're the perfect person to talk, tell us about how do you go from that idea to that first sale and dollar and beyond. In your case, generating the idea to generating over $40 million a year. Well, I was fortunate because I came up with something that didn't exist. I think it's easier to um, grow quickly when you fill a niche, when you kind of turn an industry on its head a little bit. And it's not like I had done a ton of research um, to understand business or understand what I was actually doing. It was really born out of frustration with another company and that was really only letting people in my industry, I already had like a small design firm use their service. So I thought, gosh, I could bring this to general business owners and really help them. But nobody was doing that. So it was a little bit you know, and I, and I took a leap, you know, I took a leap in terms of spending marketing dollars that I, you know, didn't really have. Well, it's a huge leap also because you say it like, but you're the pioneer and so no one's really, you know, set that path. So that's also a difficult trail to follow. So I want to, we'll talk about, um, you know, how you came up with the idea and know it was worth it to pursue. But I also like to include a fun fact. Fun fact about Joy is she was actually a high school dropout. That's right. Wow. Uh, yep, I uh, left in March of my senior year. I was just one of those 17-year-old uh, girls. Uh, there are a lot of them out there today that basically I thought I knew everything. And um, I have amazing parents. They actually signed me out of school. Like they, like you know, they were like, "Oh, joy!" You know, pretty much with every dumb idea I've ever had, which is very helpful. That's supportive, though. So before we get into the first idea, so when you dropped out, what did you do next? Um, let's see, what did I do next? I got a couple of waitress jobs. Um, I, my parents made a deal with me that for every penny I saved, they would match it to help me move into my own apartment. I just mm. couldn't wait to get out of my parents' house and live on my own and be an adult. And so I got a little apartment in Queens, New York, and I was waitressing for a while. Actually, I did a lot of crazy jobs. I didn't start my business till I was 34. I didn't start postcard What was your craziest job? <laughs> um, I sold vacation packages over the phone. Actually, you know, did you ever receive one of those things in the mail where um, it says you've won this cruise and it's really like, you know, you have to pay for it. You have so, to open it when it says that too. <laughs> yeah, so you have to open it up so people would call in and then we would just in a rotation take the calls and it actually taught me so much about sales doing that job. Um, we read a script. And every t and any consideration that a person would throw at you, any objection that a person would throw at you, there was um, on the wall in your little cubicle, 
they were numbered and you would drill them and learn exactly every single solitary objection and what the response was. And at the end of every response, you were to ask for the credit card again. And uh, I was just really good at it. <laughs> so it taught me a lot about sales. So when did you come up with the idea or how did you come up with the idea for, for Postcard Mania? Um, I had a little design firm and I started brokering printing out of it. And um, I needed to do, I had one of my customers was like 80% of my business and I could see that they were sort of like on sketchy ground and I was worried about it and I thought I better start promoting. I didn't really ever promote before then. So I got a um, package or like with from this company um, out of New York, a, a postcard company that only sold to the trade and I couldn't believe how inexpensive it was. It was like 5,000 postcards to only $425, which was pretty much unheard of back then. So I uh, designed a postcard for my little business and uh, I overnighted them a proof and a CD <laughs> or DVD. I don't even know if they had DVDs back then. And um, maybe it was a floppy disk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They Federal Expressed me back a proof, and on the proof they had their little 800 number in five point type. So I called them up and I said, "Hey, I provided this art, and I don't want your 800 number. I sell printing, and I could be a good resource for you, and I want you to remove it." And the customer service person said, "Well, obviously you didn't um, read the fine print. In order to remove that, you, you, it's fifty dollars." And I said, well, let me speak to your supervisor. Supervisor gets on, removes the, the charge, isn't going to charge me, takes it off, but basically tells me now that I know about it, next time I'll have to pay. And that was, that was it. I just went out to my little tiny team. I had like four employees and I said, okay, we're going to start a postcard company. We're going to call it Postcard Mania. And it was literally like, you know, like that. And I did have something floating around. I don't know if this ever happens to you, but you have like an idea kind of floating around but you're not you can't grab it you're not sure what it is but you can sort of feel it like there's something there mm -hmm. I was really like looking for a way to change my business so it just kind of all sort of fell together at that moment and so early on when you have a business obviously you know there's some funding that's needed um, did your family or parents ever provide any funding for you well, I needed to borrow about five grand, and I didn't have even five grand on my credit card. So I asked my dad to lend me five thousand dollars, and he he retired at fifty six. So he was already was he already retired? This was yeah, he's eighty three now. So he um, he goes, okay, I'll lend you the money, but I want a monthly income, so I want you to give me one hundred and fifty dollars a month for the rest of my life. And I was like, I would just said yes to anything at that point. So that was 15 years ago. So ten, nine years ago, I married my second husband, and you know he took over handling all our finances. And he's like, "What's this hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> that?" I'm like, "Oh, he loaned me five thousand dollars, and that was the agreement we made." You know, so he was like, "Okay." And then like he kept paying it and paying it and paying it, and then like I think it was like I don't know, maybe ten years into the loan, he like did the math on it. And actually, I don't remember. It was probably it was probably like ten years into it. Your dad so got a good deal. He did. He did get a good deal. So, yeah. So basically, we had paid him like eighteen thousand dollars. <laughs> and uh, and I was like, Dad, you know, this is kind of like extortion at this point. Don't you feel like you made a really good investment? And he finally agreed to. You know, my my husband started writing blood money on the check in the memo. <laughs> That's funny. So. What was it like early on? I mean, people see it today. Like, I was looking at the website. There's a huge, beautiful building, tons of employees, you know, thriving business. What was it like early on when you're trying to get your first customers? Oh, goodness. Well, I rented a little cottage. I think it's a hair salon now, actually. It was a house at one point. But um, this little, it had like three or four rooms and a little kitchenette. And, um, Getting our first customers, what we did is we put a flyer just to test out the idea in this little local paper that had like a 20,000 distribution. And um, we started getting phone calls and we were like, holy moly. And um, we, we would even drive to pick up money. Like I've driven all the way to like far, to like one of the beaches down south, like near St. Pete 
to pick up a check for like six hundred dollars. Uh, even my COO now, she started with me, and uh, we had this. This is a funny one. We had this guy, financial advisor, and he came to the office, and uh, he was totally closed, but he didn't have his wallet on him. Oh, it kind of sounds like you know, yeah, probably yes on that one. So we looked him up, found his home address, and drove to his house and knocked <laughs> on his door. And he was just like, OMG. Like, he couldn't even believe that we did it. Like, hi, we're here. We figure you have your checkbook here and your wallet. And uh, he gave us the money, you know. So it was very, we just like hustled our butts off to get our sales. Yeah, for sure. What was it? I mean, when you have, it sounds like you have a great, I know you have great staff there. Whenever I call, it's very friendly. How do you find a CEO that stays with you for decades? Yeah, right. Um, Let's see. I mean, my whole exec team has been with me for a long time. Yeah. Um, we have a very tight conspiracy. We have a very familial, um, cozy sort of a kinship. And, you know, especially my execs who've been with me the whole time, like, we did this together. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're very invested, you know, and um, you're, you know, they, they take ownership in it. They feel like owners, you know, they treat it that way and obviously um, I uh, you know I treat them very well and I pay them very well and I'm very open and honest with them I mean there's a whole way of treating people to get them to jump on your game and to get them to you know want to work their asses off for you and it, right. it's a, it's a it's a whole bunch of different ingredients that make that up right I mean what do you look for when you're hiring I mean obviously you keep people for the long haul what's yeah. one thing that's really important to you that you look for well we we don't want someone who's just gonna um, punch a clock you know we want someone that actually gets pleasure out of a job well done, that enjoys work, that isn't a complainer. We have an incredible hiring system in place called the No Fail Hiring System. Mm -hmm. um, it's by a guy called Patrick Valton and uh, it's pretty intense. Um, very specific questions, the types of answers we're looking for and we want to make sure that the person fits our culture. We don't allow any office politics at all in the company. Uh, you're not allowed to talk smack about anybody that works here, here or outside of work. It's a fireable offense. We like really? To keep, wow. Yeah, we want to keep a... And I have personally fired a couple of people that worked for me one six years and one four years that, we, you know, we have our um, in-house spark back and forth and they were... they got Somebody wrote them up and because if you don't... If you hear it and you don't do something about it, it's just then as bad. party to it. So this... Yeah. We all like just wrote this report on what she was hearing them talk about. Oh. We pulled their uh, spark records and we saw it. And I just I called them into my office because I consider it a betrayal, a real betrayal. So we will, you know, put a head on a pike on for that. Well, wow. yeah. And um, so, what was what were some of the challenges early on when you were growing? It's always making enough money to grow. Yeah. When you're when you don't have any capital investments and in, or injections, and you have some great idea, it always takes funds. You know, I'm always the one who gets the shaft. You know, I cut my pay. Right. To, you're to the last to get paid. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, so that's always that's always been the rough part. Like, how do we figure? How are we going to pay for this? You know, um, in 2005, I bought all my own equipment. Well, in 2004 is when I started that process, first getting a building, and then slowly bringing in all the equipment, which is a really big confront you know just in terms of like figuring it all out and finding people to advise me correctly and paying for it and how do you pay for it and you know and all that stuff so I mean the reality is people think oh this person CEO they're sitting on their throne but the reality is you get paid last and also you have a lot of expenses up front for for the equipment for the building what do you remember when you was there a time when like you had to pay everyone else and there you know wasn't as oh, much left yeah. In 2009, we were down $2 million. We were, that was the crazy year after like the whole mortgage thing was right. blown up. Right, yes. Um, we were down $2 million and we were building this building that we're in right here. And we were the, probably the last project to get funded in this whole county. And all the contractors were pretty much like running for the hills and doing like a spit and polish job and, you know, just putting things together with tiddlywinks or whatever. 
And my husband and I, not only did I not get paid, my husband and I had to put a million dollars into wow. completing the project and of our just our own money. And now we can't even get paid back. We're behind the mortgage. So we can't even start to pay us back. Like first we thought we were so smart, I'll just take my pay as a loan repayment and not have to pay taxes on it. I was like, we're geniuses. No. <laughs> it's like you cannot pay yourself until the mortgage is satisfied. So it's just stuff. Uh, it's always that was, that was a trying year, let's just say. Never ending. So what about early on? Um, do you remember one of those those first sales, how you got some of those first customers when you started gaining traction? Um, getting our first customers, I mean, really, we always did um, direct mail. So it was always a matter of the phone ringing. And I really only did sales for a very little while myself um, and then hired people to do sales and then just basically did training. So I don't have a lot of like memories of making sales except the ones that I told you about but it was just a matter of like increasing uh, the direct mail uh, to the point where we got enough leads in and just learning how to track that like how many leads come from this industry how many leads come from this industry you know chiropractors right. it's funny with chiropractors we once did one of those card decks you know those Cairo card decks and we stuck an ad in there and we literally got 750 leads. Now this is before you were getting internet leads and form fill-ins. This was right. like 750 people called us. We could never get a chiropractor back on the phone. Like the really? CAs, Why not? Because the CAs were just like block. They were just uh, like blockers. <laughs> what was uh, interesting um, an industry that you look back and you're surprised like at the time that you're like really they're they're wanting our services was there any surprises well I guess the biggest surprise was all the industries I had no idea about you know it was really a learning experience to figure out who responds to direct mail right. who, who already uses direct mail as a lead generation tool so in 2007 46 percent of our revenue is from the mortgage industry still Really? Yeah. Wow. Now the largest segment is dental and dental is about 10% of our revenue and that's the largest segment. So it's going to be diversified. We, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very, very diversified. There's over 350 different industries that use us and there's probably about 20 to 25 that are, that we mail to still. What did you find, Joy, that you thought was just going to work? You're like, this is going to be the best thing ever. This is going to launch a business, and it just flopped. Oh, my God. There's so many things that we thought were such brilliant ideas. Uh, let me see if I can think of one. Let me see if I wrote one down for you. Gosh, there was just like a zillion of them. And, I mean, I would do – let me look at my notes. Cause I'm, um, one of the things we, we tried that bombed was cold calling. You know, we bought a list that we were mailing to, and then we started calling it, and that was a bomb. I mean, it just, just this specific like industry, or was it just we, across? We tried the board? it on dental, since dental is such a great industry for right. us. Dental is like they know postcards work, they want new patients, they have money, they bank, so you know they're a really good industry for us. But cold, it, you can't get them on the phone. It's kind of like, kind of like Kairos. <laughs> <laughs> So that was a bomb, but there there have been a zillion things that we thought would be amazing that weren't wasn't. So cold calling didn't work. What anything yeah. else? Like anything you put on the postcard when you send out to the the industries that you're like, oh, we put this headline or or this I, that. I wish I I wish I had like a bunch of the postcards that bombed because, in hindsight, when you look at them in a new unit of time, you look at them and go, okay, I can see why that bombed. But mm. I designed a postcard early on that basically says, uh, you are looking at this postcard, right? Your customers will look at yours too. And then the price. I like that. Yeah, and every, that we always, to test an industry, we always go back to that design. It's always that design that pulls the best. And my current chief marketing officer, she is always trying new designs and they bomb. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, you have to try. I mean, you have to yeah. keep trying till you hit hit on other ones. What's one thing that you thought that you were surprised about that you thought, oh, we'll try it, probably won't work, but then you found that it actually worked really well? Mm, let's see. Um, what did I try that worked really well? I know, again, like there's a Been million on your examples. List that you sent me? Not on your list, right? Of yeah, what? yeah. 
then it then it's somewhere. I just have to find it. So I did figure this out. What did we try? That worked really. What about well, recent? I could tell you what I could tell you a story, a really good story about um, our own direct mail usage. Yeah. Um, when I started out, I basically I sent out a thousand pieces a week to varied industries, and I saw what the results were and we gradually raised it to about 2,500 pieces a week. Wow. And then we sort of hit a plateau and it felt like we were taking, you know, three steps forward, four steps back, three steps forward, one step back. I mean, it just was really, really the effort to move ahead and get our expansion going. It was just rough. And I read this datum. Uh, we use something called the Hubbard Management System here. I don't know if you've heard of that. Have you ever heard of mm. um, David Singer Enterprises? Yes, yeah. Okay, so it's the same management system as David Singer uses. So um, one of the datums is the size, not the quality, of an organization's mailing list. And the number of mailings to it determines the gross income of the organization. Hmm. So I thought, okay, I'm going to double the mail. And I'm going to give it four to six weeks. And that was like pretty it's expensive, pricey. though. Yeah, it was like at that time, 5,000 pieces was something like $1,000 in postage. So I could get my own cards basically thrown on a run, you know, and it sort of came out in the wash. But the postage was out of pocket. So um, it was about $1,000 a week. And that was a lot of money for me. So I tried it. And literally, and I'm not exaggerating, after four weeks, the revenue doubled. Really? Like it went, like literally it doubled and I, and I was like, it's not that I was like a non-believer. I mean, I was trying it, so I had faith in it to work, but I thought doubled, you know, I, I mean, so that was pretty amazing. That was like really an eye opener. And we mail now, um, 125,000 pieces every single week on our own behalf just wow. to get postcard mini business. How do you Plus, track all that stuff? Oh I my mean, God. it's fairly nightmarish because, um, we do. We we have a great product, and I was going to tell you about this at the end. It's called Direct Mail 2.0. I don't know if you've seen anything about it, but we basically have call tracking, mail tracking, and um, and uh, Google remarketing attached to this product. So if somebody receives your postcard, and then they go to your website, and then once they go to your website, if they leave and they don't convert, they'll now see your ad that looks like your postcard. Wow all over the internet, like every other, you know, like the Chicago Tribune or wherever you, whatever sites you go to, right. um, you'll, that are in the Google network. So there, we have a whole huge system in place for tracking all our leads. And we do, we also spend about 20 grand a week on uh, pay-per-click advertising. Wow. So it's, it's, and we use click path to, um, track what calls are coming from pay-per-click ads because a call is the best kind of a lead for us. Yeah. So, Joey, tell me, what's a moment, um, a big milestone that you hit in the business that you're especially proud of? Goodness. I would say um, when we made the Inc. 500, probably, I didn't even know what the Inc. 500 was. And um, I didn't realize what a big deal it was. But uh, to be one of the top 500 growing companies, privately owned companies in the country, was a pretty big deal. Yeah, it's a huge deal. Yeah, that was in 2005. It was fun. So what about, um, what were some of the pitfalls that you didn't expect that you hit? Pitfalls. Um, yeah. You know, it's, big... just a, it's just a big game all the time and there's always little pitfalls. I mean, I would say probably the things that I didn't realize were how expensive it was to grow a business in terms of what, um, you know, what's demanded of you by the government, like regulations yeah. and you know, and like how much health insurance has gone up, and we can't. We used to do four hundred one k matching and pay for health insurance in full. Now we we still have the four hundred one k, but we don't match, and we only pay a hundred dollars per employee per month because it's just gotten so expensive. And printing is not really a super high profit business, so it's profitable and it's great, and I love employing a lot of people, and I make a very good living. But it's you know, it's it's just very expensive. It's not. Yeah, it's not like a huge profit margin yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So what about, um, what's an interesting story? Do you have any interesting stories with um, hiring? Because, uh, I mean, you do have like a, just a lockdown system for, for hiring great staff. I, mean, I would probably, you know, 
we weren't successful every single time, you know, and that gets you working on figuring out how to get better at it. When I was doing the hiring myself, I mean, even Jennifer, the president of my company, she was running another company that was a client of ours before we were postcard mania. And um, she, uh, they were closing that company and she sent me a request to write a letter of recommendation for her in terms of like working with her as a vendor because she was going to be putting her resume out. And uh, she was really great to work with. You know, when you are printing for someone and you're doing all their design work and it's all custom, it's, you know, there's a lot of variables, there's a lot of room for mistakes and problems and they too were using the Hubbard management system so they were doing a ton of mailings and we were doing all their business. And um, she really was great to work with. She was very sane and handled problems very sanely. It was never like, you better take one million percent responsibility for this when she approved something that was incorrect, right. you know. So I really liked her and so she had the intention, of, she wanted to come work for me but she didn't want to seem like she was desperate or looking for something so she she played it by asking me for this. She kind of tossed a softball yeah. in your, in yeah, your court. Yeah, exactly. So we went to lunch and I really needed someone in accounting and she really wanted to run the company and I said well I only have 15 staff I, I it's kind of my job at the moment you know and um it's a lot so, of staff though I mean you say only yeah. right I mean compared to now but most people when they're starting out that's a lot yeah so that was probably like three or four years into it and um so she said she'd be willing to do whatever was needed and wanted um to get her foot in the door and um and then what happened was is she had to take over my sales manager was taking a little hiatus and she had to take over that area and she'd never done sales and she'd never run a sales area but she had a lot more management experience than I did she ran bigger organizations and she just jumped in and did it and it it kind of showed me the kind of person that you want to have on your team you know like I already had my COO who was totally like that although that wasn't her post title at the time I think she was production manager or something. But these guys would do whatever was needed and wanted. If sales were down, it was like, okay, all hands on sales. Like, everybody, let's start dialing. Um, and I think that that's what kind of gave me the standard in terms of who I wanted to hire, someone who really wanted to be here, who was interested in playing the game, who would do what was ever, whatever was needed and wanted and not be kind of a snob about it, you know? Like yeah. that's my job description. Right. Who says that can go find another job. You know? I mean, it seems like also, Joy, that you're really good about kind of adapting. Like early on when you saw one of your customers was eight or it was 80% of your in your business, you adapted. And what's something that you've seen with that your users or customers have demanded that you've listened to that you wouldn't have realized other otherwise? And also I could see like you're integrating the offline to online. What's something that you heard from your customers that you're like, wow, I wouldn't have realized this and this kind of helped your business? Well, one of the things is people want results. Business owners want results. That's what they're really buying. We, you know, we don't bill ourselves as selling a commodity. You can buy postcards anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're selling is the correct way to do direct mail so that you get the maximum results possible. So what, because that was always the biggest reason why someone wasn't, wouldn't re-sign, it was never because we didn't give them good customer service or they didn't like the way their postcard looked, it was that they didn't get the results that they had hoped for. So what we did is we hired a person that we deemed the results manager. Mm -hmm. And what they did was catalog the results of every campaign. And before we had the tracking built in, because we have that now, you know, she had to call our customers and get all the data from them. Right. A lot of customers don't track that well. Right. Even saying, well, this is our design and we keep using this one because the phones ring off the hook whenever we mail this out. Even that was enough to go back to somebody in that same industry and say, okay, look, this is what, you know, Dr. Weiss says. So, you know, it's working for him. So you might want to try this in your area. It's so a huge selling that. point. Yeah. It also differentiated us from the rest of the competition. When we started Postcard Mania, we really didn't have any competitors, but now there's a postcard company on every virtual corner. So we had to really say, well, what can we do for our customers that nobody else is doing? And that was it. Nobody else is doing that. And even though we PR the, you know, we PR it 
all over the place that we're the only ones that do it. No, it's very difficult for a business owner to take on that expense, a full full time salary, um, for something that you know they're not sure of. Yeah, I remember reading in your story on your website too that you know it's one of the first companies. It wasn't just for postcards, but you were actually giving them marketing advice. How right. did you like from your career? How did you learn all this? Oh, like, trial and error, probably. <laughs> <laughs> just doing it. Like anytime I would do something in business and it would work, I would write a little article about it. Anytime I would do something that didn't work, I would write a little article about it. And there really wasn't, you know, when we started 15 years ago, there weren't, I mean, we had like a little website that was a brochure. And then I spent like $30,000 on like a really great website <laughs> that was great for that, for that time period. But it was like I was able, I still couldn't, there wasn't any content management stuff where mm -hmm. you could do things yourself. But, um, but it, it was like pretty robust and I started just adding, you know, all my articles into the website. Um, and we couldn't, I didn't find any of that stuff online. I didn't see anybody else right. doing that. So it made us, um, how I felt was that it made us really transparent. Like I, I really wanted to help people. That was really truly the purpose. And if they came to me, great. And if they didn't come to me, that's okay too. There's 25 million small businesses in the U.S. Six million of them employ people. That's really who our customer is, not the solopreneur that uses Vistaprint. And you know, it's it's really the real brick and mortar business owners. Right. So um, I really felt like, wow, we can we can affect the economy. We can actually help this country by helping people. And when you when you have a real purpose that you're passionate about, it, it sort of the, that comes through, and people want to work with you. Yeah. So, what's one thing you tell? The audience to do right now if they want to start getting traction in their business and start getting sales what's your advice to them I have a couple of things um, one is besides start using postcard media yeah really. <laughs> um, whatever marketing you're doing yeah. what I have learned from you know I have 57,000 customers that's 57,000 small business owners yeah. and we do events every year a couple of times a year we it's our client appreciation event uh, our take it to the next level event and what I've learned from meeting so many small business owners is that they don't have the correct estimation of effort. And, and when I say that, I'm not talking about their hard work. I'm talking about putting communication out and how much communication you have to put out to get in the amount that you want to get in. Right. So, um, you know, we mail out 125,000 postcards a week on our own behalf. We spend $20,000 a week on pay-per-click. Obviously, that didn't happen overnight. Right. But we spend 15% of revenue on marketing. And that's a lot of marketing. And you can do, and that doesn't include payroll. I have probably 10 full-time people in marketing. I have two full-time social media managers. Um, now, of course, it didn't start out that way. But we kept as we grew we kept growing the marketing and growing the marketing and that that's the thing that i see the most is that they think that if they mail out you know five thousand pieces a month it's going to bring them in the type of revenue they need and it's just not true uh... it's different for different industries that could be perfect for you know a particular industry um, that's one thing the second thing is in the hubbard management system you learn to uh, keep really good metrics and keep statistics on everything that you do. And if you're in a business where it takes specific number of closes, like in chiropractic, you have lifetime value of a customer. So I would recommend that if you have a customer that comes back all the time, you should understand what that lifetime value is. You should understand how many times they come to you in a year, how much they spend, what does the average customer spend, so that you, you're starting with something of what you're going for. Then how many how many hits how many con points of contact does it take to get one person to come in for an appointment? How many times do you have to mail to them or reach out to them or call them to get them to reach out and come in? So it's even if you're in a business like mine where you're doing all your sales over the phone, for us it's like you know we track how many dials, how many contacts, how many quotes do we send out, and every salesperson gets. A, you know, sort of a dashboard of where they're at from one month to the next. So right. it's really a matter of counting everything. Yeah. Now that's great advice because oftentimes we don't do that and we don't even know our own metrics. And if you know your lifetime value, you can know how much you could spend 
to acquire exactly. a new customer or a patient or whatever that is. And we, exactly. we don't do that math most times. Exactly. We just do what we normally do, which or whatever trade we're and then in. You go, it's, suddenly, I don't know why the numbers are down. Where did all the patients go? Where are all the customers? Why aren't the phones right. ringing? And if you keep all those metrics, you can go look back at them. Like we look, summers are always slower for us. So every summer we pull out the year before summer's numbers and we go, okay, we're going to have to up our outflow by 25% and see what can we do. We don't want to spend that, you know, all that more money, but we have dialers, we have things we can do. We can push on our sales reps to, you know, stay an hour later. They're all commission based. So, you know, you can be cause over that stuff if you know how many dials, how many contacts, how many quotes it takes to get that one sale. Yeah. What is that average sale? That's great advice. Yeah. So I want to ask you too, what, um, people always wonder, like, what tools, systems, or software you use in your business, in your life? You're a wife, you're a mom, you, you, you know, run a huge business. How do you do it all? Like, what do you use in your life to, to keep it all straight? I would say um, at work we discovered Basecamp. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Basecamp is pretty much like the bomb. I mean, it's we have so many projects going on at once that – I, for me as the CEO, it was difficult for me to know what everybody was doing. Like you send an email out to someone and you're waiting for a response. If they don't respond, you have to kind of go into your sent box and start, you know, sort by your execs, start looking at what you're trying to remember that you asked them for that, you know what I mean? It's a little bit difficult to manage it all. But when you put every project from every division into Basecamp, Basecamp is just a project management web-based program. It's basecamp.com for your, your listeners. Um, and they give you like I think 30 or 60 days free trial. But anything that you're working on, it, it operates. You get an email notification, but any, any subject that there's a conversation on, instead of having to read like a zillion emails going down in the wrong direction, you can see every attachment, every document, every updated document all through like one screen you can scroll and see the entire project so that really made things a lot easier for me anything in your life because you run a huge business and in my personal life? yeah like that you do to stay productive or to actually get time for yourself I mean you have 200 oh, I, employees I have plenty of time for myself I mean when you have 200 staff it's because you know how to delegate <laughs> and uh, I definitely know how to delegate I mean I was just in LA for a month doing personal things. I mean, I'm on my email every day, but right. you know, I don't come into the office till noon every day. I work out, I ride my bike, I you know, quietly do my emails in my pajamas with my coffee in the morning. Um, it helps that I have um, a great family and great husband. Um, my husband's a business owner. He has his own totally separate business and uh, we're just great you know, to talk to each other and um, give each other advice. And my kids are, I'm just really fortunate. I don't have a lot of problems. I don't really have any real problems, you know, like anything to speak of. So, um, like my son just got, I just picked him up from the airport actually before I got to work today. He flew in from New York, but he was, he traveled around the world for the last three months. Really? Holy and cow. He's 22 and now he's seen more of the world than I have. <laughs> How do you feel about that? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm jealous. What can I say? Um, he uh, he went to uh, the French Culinary Institute, became a chef, decided wow. he didn't really want to be a chef. He didn't want to be on his feet 12 hours a day. It's hard. Um, he really wants to own his own business. He's one of these natural born marketers and he's going to come. I wonder where he got it from. CMO. I know. I was, it's, it's funny because I never like thought. Is of it really him. natural born or did he from, from no, osmosis? He no, he really is. Like seriously. Like have you ever heard of, do you have kids? Yes, but she can't, she, she's, she's too. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's this thing called Gaia Online. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but they have like 40 million users. My son became famous on this website. Like, really? seriously famous. Like, I took him to Comic Con, like, maybe it was four or five years ago in LA. And when he gave his username, people were like, wanted his autograph. Like, really? he, he's, he's got this natural ability. He's very entrepreneurial, too. He's, always like make it he one time my husband found like hundreds of dollars in his pants pocket like he just makes money he just <laughs> sells stuff on ebay he's just kind of crazy he's got a knack for it he does so he's what do you think he'll end up doing well he wants to have his own business we'll see how that sort of morphs itself right now he wants to do specifically restaurant marketing because he knows restaurants so well mm -hmm. and he's a chef um but he's going to come apprentice my chief marketing officer for six months 
and then he's going to do sales for me for six months because I told him really if you want to have your own business you need to really know marketing and sales yeah and so even though he's a natural at it he just needs to like do it and he has he worked here for two years and did all kinds of random things so um, he's excited to get into the sales That's area. That's the best education money pays you right? Exactly. Yeah. My other son's coming home to work here too soon. He's um, a film student and uh, he's going to basically be my slave for a year. I mean, <laughs> I'll pay him, but he's going to make us a ton of videos. and That's huge. Yeah, I know. So and he's really talented, so it'll be good. <laughs> Joy, what, um, what question didn't I ask you or story that we didn't talk about so far that would be important to include in the postcard mania story? I think that you know an important thing is if you're starting something from scratch, you have to get all the naysayers out of your life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I did a very specific, like, you know, went through my contact list, and I think it was called a Rolodex back when I did it, um, and basically stopped any communication with anyone that I just didn't feel like made me feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. You know, you're with someone and you leave, and you kind of feel a little awkward or like introverted. Yes just decided I'm not talking to any of those people not forever yeah no I know what you mean no I I was I don't I mean when I started my business when I started working for myself I mean the job I came from I was making maybe 400 bucks a week I mean I wasn't making any money and I drove a beat-up Chevy Beretta with a recalled paint job and I had two kids and you know little kids and and I, you know it was not an easy time and I just didn't want anyone who was going to tell me I couldn't do it or that good luck with that or you know with not a real sincere good luck with that right you know I just didn't want any people like that it's around. hard enough as it is you yeah. want to surround yourself with positive people who are going to kind of lift you up yeah and you know it sounds kind of random but like pretty much when I tell people that I'll just say like think about like who you have that you're really kind of intimately connected to. Yeah. And any one of them that comes to mind that's not really a positive person in your life, like you just have to just, you know, get rid of them or you're just not going to be happy in any area. Right. Um, that was really a successful thing for me. I mean, I very actively did that. Yeah. There was one person that I didn't talk to for five years that I'm now super good friends with again, but I really just went, I'm not talking to this person. There's <laughs> No, that's smart. I mean, oftentimes we just kind of go with the flow and whatever happens, happens. But that's a huge thing in our daily life. If they're kind of, you know, we're interacting with them, it affects us. Exactly. So what? before we end, I have one last question for you. I appreciate your time. Um, what is, if you could just tell us a little bit more about your business, what you're excited about right now, you have a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm super excited about Direct Mail 2.0 because... We're the only company that can do this, and it's very exciting because you can see exactly when your mail is going to hit. We add a code to the card, so that, and you can go online and see exactly what days they're going to hit the mailboxes. You can track exactly which card they're calling you from, and you can see the calls, and you can record the calls. The calls are recorded, so you can listen to them, so if you have front desk people, or you know how you're always asking, like, make sure you ask them how they heard about us. They mean to do that. They intend to do that, but it's kind of like, well, you'll, you'll in the midst of everything else. Yeah, yeah you realize this when your when your daughter's a little bit older. It's like telling your kid to, you know, pick up that toy that's always at the door that you trip on. They they don't mean to leave it there, you know, but you have to tell them over and over and over and over and over again. It's like a marketing message, and it's the same thing with finding out where your leads are coming from. And even if you looked in my database, to, and to and sorted by unknown, you'd still get like a ton from years before when we couldn't track everything of us not knowing where these leads came from. And you can't strengthen an area if you don't know where it came from. So with Direct Mail 2.0, um, not only do you get that repeat message, which is so expensive generally, but with remarketing with Google, you'll see that ad over and over again. Like sometimes a person will see your ad 150 times and they can click on it and go right back to your site and you have that repeat message so that product with the call tracking mail tracking and the follow me feature which is the google remarketing is just so super exciting it really takes everybody's results to a whole new level what made you decide to incorporate that because i could see with the other features most i mean you could have stopped there and it have been good what made you decide to add in the re the retargeting it's you know it really is what people want they want to integrate 
um, all their marketing. They want to use Google. Do you know that Google only has one million business customers? Mm -mm. It's a no. very small number when you consider. You're catching up to them. <laughs> yeah, fifty thousand. <laughs> Um, when you consider that there are 25 million small businesses and that there are 6 million that employ people, most businesses are not comfortable with the internet. They're not comfortable with pay-per-click advertising. They're not comfortable right. with search engine optimization. So one of the things that we did so successfully in the beginning with direct mail is we made it really understandable and easy to do and made it a one-stop shopping experience for a small business owner that's <laughs> You know, like what you're doing is pretty amazing. Like normally, you know, you guys are just cracking backs all day and you don't have time to do all this other stuff, you know. How many doctors work for you? I just have uh, three massage therapists. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. Because, um, you know, usually the business owner is the deliverer of the product or service and they don't have time to learn all this marketing. So um, considering that, Google doesn't have that many customers considering that they're Google. I mean, you know, they have one sixth of the businesses that employ people. I realize that most small business owners don't understand how to get on the Google bandwagon, how to start using that technology. And this is a this is kind of like a baby step into it for them. They can get the Google remarketing without having um, any pay-per-click or AdWords budget or even Google Analytics, although of course we try to get them to use Google Analytics, which is free. And yeah, we'll link up your website, but just so, can you spell it out or say it for people sure. so they go to it? Sure, it's postcardmania.com and we have that little giveaway if they want um, the first three chapters of my book, uh, they can go to postcardmania.com slash power dash marketing. Yeah, we'll link that up too and that's the ultimate postcard success manual. Right. Yeah, the, the, the ultimate postcard marketing success manual, and there is data in there about integrating your email and your Google with your direct mail. So my last question is, Joy, you know, I wanted to hear what advice you give your kids because, you know, also they say, they see mom, like, did they ever say, mom, uh, you dropped out of high school and you turned out amazing. Like, I don't want to go to college. Like, what do you, what, uh, you know, they see what you did. What advice do you give them or what do they say about kind of how everything transpired? You know, well, they basically are taking um, uh, sort of a less conformist path. I mean, my son went, you know, just went around the world for three months and he went to culinary school, which was a one year program. And my other son is in a short pro he was actually he went to the New York Film Academy and after the first semester he said, I want to stop doing this, I want to go to full time graphic design school. We switched him over to Shillington and then now he's going back for motion graphics. Um, they're both they can see that they can do anything that they want to do and they don't need a formal education. They just need to be good at studying and good at learning and interested in learning. And they both they they both um, are very interested in learning. Um, I'm very lucky. I'm really good friends with both my kids. Neither one of them touches drugs or even alcohol. Like, you so know. how'd you do that for for parents listening? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's a funny thing. Um, one of the things is is you know our religion. I'm a Scientologist, and we live in a neighborhood in Clearwater, Florida, where there's a lot of Scientologists, but there's also a lot of people who are very like, what is that? What is that weird cult that these people belong to? And it's kind of, there's a lot of controversy. And when like my son, Zach was very little, he would have these temper tantrums. And he was a little, little guy and uh, like four or five years old and he would just lose it, you know? And I, one day I said to him, I go, honey, it's totally fine with me if you lose it. But can you do it indoors? Because if you do it in the driveway, the neighbors know we're Scientologists. It's going to look weird. They're going to think we're weird. Wait, how and does him freaking out equate with Scientology? Oh, they'll, they'll blame everything. You know? Oh, I got gotcha. yeah. oh, okay. So one time, like I, we were we, we were getting home from somewhere, and he was about to have a fit, and I looked at him, and he ran in the house and had his fit in there. And you know, both my kids, you know, Scientology is really based on very high ethic standard very high morals um, and you know following the, the rule of the law even if the law is stupid and one of the as I became higher and higher profile in this community like pretty much I'm in the newspaper a lot here locally and everybody knows I'm a Scientologist and you know I said listen you guys you can't drink you can't do underage drinking because hmm. even though I don't think you're irresponsible and I don't and the drinking age was 18 when I was 18 
it, it really would be bad for the family if something, if you got caught or if something happened or, you know, we can't, we have to just follow the letter of the law. Uh, we can't have any skeletons in our closet. And they're really respectful of that. And um, they just toe the line, you know, they're just not interested in, they, they want to be successful. They want to be, you know, um, they want to do something with themselves. It's really funny with James, my younger son living in New York, um, he's got, um, I don't know, like over 3,000 people following him on Instagram now. And he's really into this photography filmmaking thing. And uh, he's James Rockwell on Instagram. If anybody wants we'll to follow him, we'll look at his feed. Yeah. And he said, you know what, Mom? I'm like, I'm, I'm not Zachary's brother here. I'm not Zachary's little brother. I'm not Joy Jindu's son. I'm like, I have my own identity yeah. here in New York. And it's really exciting for him. You know, he kind of... I guess my husband sets a really good example too. So we're like super ethical, and we, you know, and they just have this example to look at, and we're happy. You know, we don't fight with each other, so I guess that yeah. helps. Joy, I appreciate your time. This has been awesome talking to you, and I know the audience is going to love listening to this. So thanks again for uh, for everything today. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. This is great.